You are now about to witness the strength of street knowledge. This is the art and promise proclaimed at the beginning of NWA's Straight Out of Compton. Right before a pounding beat set off a collection of songs that would catapult the young hip hop group onto the American music scene with raw power and anarchy. The group's five members, Dr. Dre, Ice Cube, Eazy-E, MC Ren, and DJ Yella, knew all about street knowledge. They were barely removed from their former lives as high school dropouts and drug dealers living in one of Los Angeles' poorest neighborhoods, suffering under the oppression of the LAPD years before the horrific beating of Rodney King. Their debut album, which sold over three million copies, was a no-holds-barred audio documentary of ghetto life with rappers operating as self-professed street reporters who honestly and brazenly described the harsh reality of life as a person in the streets of South Central LA. NWA was not the first hip hop group to testify about street knowledge. Situated at the crossroads of lack and desire, scholar Trisha Rhodes writes, hip hop emerged from the deindustrialized meltdown where social alienation, prophetic imagination, and yearning intersected. The 70s were lean, mean years in the sections of New York City, especially in the Bronx and other low-income areas where most people of color lived. Malcolm X, Martin Luther King Jr., and Fred Hampton had all been killed. The optimism of the civil rights movement had faded. New York City was broke, and city officials were cutting funding for all the basic services and education and arts programming and job training. Absentee landlords neglected properties until building after building fell into disrepair or went up in flames. Life-destroying drugs like heroin haunted crime-ridden streets where people did whatever they could to put food on their tables and stay alive. And yet, in the face of all that, the youth of the city of New York refused to shut down. And their hope-filled energy gave way to creative new form of life that rose up from the ashes of economic despair. Young people from the Bronx, many of them teenagers, developed experimental ways of spinning and scratching records that revolutionized American music. It was immigrants from Jamaica and Barbados, like DJ Cool Herc, Grandmaster Flash, and Africa Bombada, that gave birth to more than just hip hop music. They founded a community where people were free to express their thoughts and feelings in innovative styles of dance and poetry, fashion, and visual art. Eventually, all these pieces of resistance to economic oppression grooved together to create a unique culture with five distinct elements, rapping MCs, record-spinning DJs, breakdancing B-boys, and graffiti artists all united and infused with a fifth and most important element of hip-hop culture, street knowledge. Street knowledge. In the early 80s, African Babata founded what is called the Universal Zulu Nation, whose motto was peace, love, unity, and having fun, and developed infinity lessons, a code of conduct for living an honorable life that emphasized these values, community, peace, wisdom, freedom, justice, unity, responsibility, respect for others, and respect for self. And then Bambada put his knowledge into words which radiated throughout New York City and across America, inspiring countless others to discover the lessons of street knowledge. As a former gang leader himself, Bambada had a lot of respect and he used that power to make peace between enemies. The flyers for his dance parties announced, come one, come all, leave your colors at home. Come together in peace and unity. Because he knew the power that music had to break down barriers that divided people. And his legendary dance parties brought rival grant gangs together in New York City for the first time to dance together in peace. We've always had this notion of street smarts. But according to the founders of hip hop, street knowledge is more than that. It's the study and application of ancestral wisdom. It refers to the common sense wisdom of poor urban families and the techniques and phrases and codes and gestures they developed to survive modern life in the harsh inner cities of America. Street knowledge is the accumulation of this 
hip-hop's cultural self-awareness, the ability to reason soundly without the ideas of the traditional mainstream. And so contrary to the myth that wisdom is only found in the quiet and ordered academic environments of the ivory tower, hip-hop's communal knowledge is found in different places, with artists and comedians, poets and authors who learn and then transfer that knowledge to others within their own community, which believes that people can take control of their lives through the power of self-knowledge and self-expression, and that street knowledge itself offers people a shared culture and language and experience to draw upon to resist and survive the deathly hollows of a bleak and uncertain world. Hip-hop has changed a lot since the early days. Not all rap music contains street knowledge anymore. And yet, while fewer artists today display what the founders call street knowledge, it's important to recognize that hip-hop originated as a countercultural movement of resistance to a dream deferred, and as a counter to the harsh and oppressive economic reality of the 70s and early 80s in New York City, responding to it with values like wisdom and community, peace, freedom, justice, love, unity, responsibility, and respect. It shows us Wisdom comes from unexpected sources. It is found in unexpected places. But did anyone listen to the message? Did anyone hear the voice of wisdom crying out from the streets? Did the words fall on deaf ears because of the people and the place it came from or the medium by which it was delivered? Was the wisdom of street knowledge heeded or was it wholly ignored? It wouldn't be the first time wisdom was ignored, would it? Proverbs begins with people engaged in a wholesale rejection of Lady Wisdom. Wisdom cries out on the streets, it says. In the squares, she raises her voice. At the busiest corner, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gates, she speaks. How long, O simple ones, she cries, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? Long before hip-hop had its haters. Lady Wisdom had her own detractors. They were just called scoffers at the time. We've had many different kinds of haters throughout world history, critics, cynics, skeptics, scorners, doubters, despisers, and hecklers, but scoffer, a scoffer is a particular kind of hater who mocks and jeers at something with contempt. They're not just cynical and sarcastic, which can be fun, but cynical and sarcastic in an angry and arrogant and derisive way, which is where the Hebrew word scoff comes from. They often laugh about a person or idea that they think is silly or stupid. They are not open to reason. They show no respect for their opponents. They belittle and insult those that are with differing points of view, and they are not open to any correction or reproof. As my daughter would say, they are the worst. Suffice it to say, we've all been around our fair share of scoffers. And if we're honest, we can admit many of us have participated in our fair share of scoffing from time to time. Scoffing can even be quite enjoyable as Proverbs states, scoffers take delight in their scoffering. But there is a stern warning in this text that scoffing at the wisdom that cries out in the streets is an incredibly dangerous activity that will likely bring more calamity and distress and anguish and death and disaster upon us like a whirlwind or a storm, which given the horror that we've seen in Western Carolina this week from Hurricane, we should want no part of that mess. Calamity compounds when wisdom is absent. The problem is that the choice is not always cut and dry. The world often presents itself not as wisdom and foolishness to choose from, but as a choice between different kinds of wisdom. It's not that we don't hear wisdom crying out in the streets, but that we prefer a softer wisdom, a more holy, a higher wisdom, a wisdom that transcends the ordinary every day and rises above the mundane problems that have always been in the streets. Many of us imagine that if we could discover this wisdom from on high, then we can apply it to the problems that we see in the streets. 
Sometimes we even say things like, if we could only get our favorite lessons from the great wisdom teachers in our lives, like Richard Rohr and Cynthia Bourgeau and Marcus Borg and Thich Nhat Hanh and Deepak Chopra and Pima Chodron and Eckhart Tolle and on and on and on, if we could just get the lessons from those wisdom teachers into the hands of the poor and oppressed, right? It would solve the problems. Spiritually progressive people like us can fall into the trap of prioritizing a highbrow, erudite, transcendent wisdom over the tough and grizzled wisdom that we find in the streets. But as Hebrew teacher Kathleen O'Connor tells us, we aren't introduced to wisdom in the ivory towers, the lofty positions, the, the thick books, the intimidating libraries, but in the streets with the people. She's shouting in the domain of the common person where anyone can access her, and yet this still does not take away from her beauty, her ability to reflect our creator. It is in the struggles of ordinary people to survive, she says, that Lady Wisdom extends her invitation. And this will be proven to us once more as Wisdom is now crying out to us from the streets of Western Carolina. The limits of highbrow, ivory tower, institutional wisdom was never clearer to us than in the violent reaction that university administrators had to the peaceful student protests for a ceasefire in Gaza that happened on college campuses of all places this past year. The knowledge and authority of the academy, typically viewed as the height of wisdom, was wildly eclipsed by the moral wisdom of students crying out in the streets and from encampments for peace. For those seeking to be wise, this is an extremely important lesson because it reveals that one of the ways to determine the difference between knowledge and wisdom or the different kinds of wisdom that the world is offering is that wisdom always calls for the end of violence. Wisdom always calls for the creation of peace. When we call out for stricter legislation to stop the scourge of gun violence, that is wisdom crying out in the streets. When we call for an end to police killings of unarmed black and brown people, it is wisdom crying out in the streets. When we call for rights and protections for trans and non-binary people, it is wisdom crying out in the streets for peace. When we call for the human treatment, the humane treatment of immigrants coming to this country, fleeing distressing situations. It is wisdom crying out in the streets. When we call for everyone to have access to food and medical care, education and affordable housing, it is always wisdom crying out in the streets for peace. How do we know that wisdom is peace and peace is wisdom? Well, there is kind of a strange path that gets us there. Proverbs tells us that wisdom built her house on seven pillars, but never tells us what those seven pillars are. The only place we find those seven pillars is outlined of all places in the book of James, written hundreds of years later after Proverbs, where it says, wisdom from above is pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy, good fruits, without a trace of impartiality or hypocrisy. And to drive this point home, that heavenly wisdom is essentially about peace, James concludes his litany of seven pillars with this beautiful phrase, and a harvest of justice is sown in peace for those who make peace. Today we th tend to think of pillars like we have here as load-bearing tools used to distribute weight in buildings, but the ancient world had a dual purpose. Beyond their functional use in architectural design, they were also religious and spiritual symbols, symbols of the connection between heaven and earth below. And the fact that Lady Wisdom built her house on seven pillars illustrates that there is supposed to be a line uniting divine wisdom from on high with the wisdom in the streets. Both the heavens and the streets are crying for peace. Why did James have to remind his community about the seven pillars of wisdom? 
Well, because people in the church at that time were claiming to have wisdom, but their actions reflected a different reality. In fact, some had separated wisdom from good works of love and generosity and justice, proclaiming that a wise faith was all you needed to have, even if it never bore, bore good fruit in the world. But James was careful to point out that this kind of wisdom was neither heavenly nor street-driven, but nothing more than the wisdom of the world, or as he said later, the cultural assumptions of the Roman Empire, like patronage and land ownership, which maintained the status quo, giving exorbitant favor to the wealthy and keeping the poor in poverty. According to James, the world is driven by this false wisdom which runs directly counter to the logic and wisdom of God. He went so far as to call it demonic because he saw it as the imperial wisdom of Rome and that it was filled with bitterness and envy, selfish ambition, boastfulness and falseness to the truth, which was leading to great disorder and wickedness, not only in society, but also in the church. We live in a confusing world with every force on the planet telling us they have the answers and that their wisdom can save us from the problems we face. But drawing on Proverbs, James clears a path for us through the fog, the way to tell the difference between true wisdom and false wisdom is the fruit that it produces in the world, particularly fruit for the poorest and most vulnerable and oppressed. Those who have true wisdom, James says, will show it by their good works because, as James insists, true wisdom is always pure, peacemaking, kindly, considerate, compassionate, bearing good fruits without hypocrisy and always reaping a harvest of justice, love, and peace. Therefore, we should be careful not to give too much credence or attention to people who profess to have spiritual wisdom but offer nothing to the people crying out in the streets. When I was 15, my best friend and I, Mike Mulchin was his name, went to see one of the fathers of hip hop, KRS-One, in Allentown, Pennsylvania. His name means knowledge reigns supreme, rooted and grounded in the street knowledge that hip hop culture provides. We were the only two white kids in the entire theater in Allentown, Pennsylvania that night. And yet we were welcomed with open arms. We had no idea that we were entering into a culture of peace that was created in resistance to a world of oppression. All we wanted to do was hear KRS-One rap. We're still today trying to understand what we experienced. And I'll never forget the wisdom that KRS-One shared on stage that night. He said, hip hop is God's response to our suffering. And this gospel, he said, acknowledges and celebrates the love that has saved our people from self-destruction. The way to experience God is to experience true love, he said, and this is achieved not by receiving love, but by becoming love itself. God has chosen you to be here, he said that night, in this space and in this time, to do something that only you can do. He said, I can't stand here and tell you what it is, but deep inside yourself, as you take time to uncover it, ask yourself some vital questions to discover. What is it that brings me peace? What is it that brings me joy? What do I love doing? What part can I play for the betterment of society and the world in which I want to live? And now, he said, visualize the world you desire, the one you want to live in, and don't be afraid to dream. Dreams are powerful. Our forebearers' dream gave birth to this church, a church of peace in the middle of World War II because they felt that war was the greatest form of foolishness in history. As one of our founders said, Religion is the ultimate antidote to the stupidity of war. Which is why they founded this church on those very same pillars of wisdom. Because they knew that wisdom was not only crying out in the streets of Europe, but also in the streets across town on the west side of Charlotte. 
And over the years, they built a community that was open to all and closed to none and worked intentionally to break down barriers that were traditionally constructed to keep out the wisdom of the streets, to keep the wisdom of street knowledge out of the church. They broke those barriers down. But wisdom did not stop crying out from the streets in the 40s or the 60s or the 80s or the 2000s. Lady Wisdom keeps on crying out from the streets with the same message. In every age, in every decade, with every generation, people who seek to be wise must listen to her cries and continue to strive to find new ways to be pure and peaceable, yielding and merciful, good, impartial, and sincere. And the promise is that if we do, we will experience a great harvest of love and justice, which is sown in peace for people who make peace. From the streets of Russia and Ukraine, to the streets of Yemen and Kenya, to the streets of Lebanon and Israel, to the streets of Gaza and the West Bank, to the streets of New York and Charlotte, to the streets now of Western Carolina, Lady Wisdom is still crying out to us. The haters are still hating, the scoffers are still scoffing, but the wisdom of heaven is rising up from the people in the streets who are desperate for peace. Like the pillars of a new creation, it has already been established, but is waiting for us to come and to build it up into a beloved community. Wisdom is waiting for you and me to open our ears to the uncomfortable and unexpected sounds of street knowledge that is born and bred in the harsh reality of life among the poor and the suffering. Wisdom isn't waiting for us in the halls of the university or at the feet of another mystical guru, but in the tears of those who are grieving a loved one in the screams of those who've lost everything in a violent storm or flood, in the cries of children who are going to bed hungry, in the hearts of those who are suffering from poverty, in the bodies of those who are dying under the weight of oppression, in the laments of those whose dreams have been deferred, and in the streets where people are still doing everything they can to put food on their tables and clothes on their backs and a roof over their heads. Wisdom is not an ethereal mystery. But as Jesus said in the Gospels, wisdom is vindicated by her children. She is justified by her fruit. She is seen in the eyes of those who do good works of love and justice and peace. And wisdom is still raising her voice. She is still crying out in the streets. She's still shouting in the highways and the byways of the world and asking the same question, will you ignore me or will you embrace me? Will you scoff at me or will you listen to me? Will you reject me, or will you heed my message and stake your claim on my seven pillars and bear the fruit of peace? Amen.